Hello, everyone. I'm Sharon Goldstein, and I'm the Director of Day School Programs at Gateways, and I want to welcome you all to the second of five webinars in our series, Our Daughters, Our Future, an educational series exploring girls' mental health and wellness. At Gateways, our mission is to provide high-quality special education services, expertise, and support to enable students with diverse learning needs to succeed in Jewish educational settings and participate meaningfully in Jewish life. Mental health can also be a barrier to academic success. If you look at any newspaper or magazine these days, they are filled with articles about the current mental health crisis. At Gateways, we are continuing to work to raise awareness and reduce the stigma around mental illness. And our goal is to give all of us the knowledge and the strategies to support our young people. We wanna thank our sponsors for this evening's webinar, Gateways Parenting with Purpose, the Ruderman Synagogue Inclusion Project and the Darish family. And we are so grateful to the Miriam Fund of Boston's Combined Jewish Philanthropies for sponsoring this webinar series. The agenda for this evening is to hear first from Arna, who will share her moving story, followed by our speaker, Lynn Lyons. We encourage you to use the chat function to ask questions or offer your thoughts as the speakers present. And then after Lynn is finished, Dr. Rachel Shine, the coordinator of this webinar series, will pose the questions that you've asked throughout the presentation. Before I turn this over to Rachel, I just want to remind you all that you will receive resources and a survey following this event. We definitely wanna hear your feedback and know about additional topics that might be of interest to you in the future. Rachel. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Rachel Shine, and as Sharon mentioned, I am the coordinator of this uh, wonderful series. Um, somebody did pose a question of whether or not there will be a recording of this webinar, and yes, there will be a recording, which uh, we will send to you um, with the resources at the conclusion um, or tomorrow over in the next few days. Um, so I am thrilled um, to first welcome Arna Dixit, who is um, a storyteller um, on teen mental health and wellness, um, and she will share her own journey with us. Um, Arna is a freshman at NYU. She is originally from India, um, and prior to going to college, she lived in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, after we hear from Arna, uh, we will then hear from Lynn Lyons, um, who is our speaker this evening. Uh, Lynn is a licensed clinical social worker um, and psychotherapist in Concord, New Hampshire. Um, she has been in private practice for 29 years, uh, specializing in the treatment of anxiety disorders in adults and children. Um, Lynn travels internationally as a speaker and trainer on the subject of anxiety its role in families, and the need for the, a preventative approach at home and in schools. She is a sought after expert, appearing in the New York Times, Time, NPR, Psychology Today, and on other media outlets. Um, with a special interest in breaking the generational cycle of worry in families, which we all know very well, um, <laughs> Lynn is um, has authored several books and articles on anxiety, including Anxious Kids, Anxious Parents, Seven Ways to Stop the Worry Cycle and Raise Courageous and Independent Children, and the companion book for kids, Playing with Anxiety, Casey's Guide for Teens and Kids. And she is also the co-host of a popular podcast called Fluster Clucks. Um, so we are so thrilled to have Lynn and Arna with us tonight. And again, I will remind folks, if you have questions, um, please post them in the chat. We will be answering questions at the end. Um, so we will not be interjecting during this webinar to answer questions, but I can assure you that we will get to your questions um, at the end. And we may group them together if some people have the, have the similar questions. So, all right, Arna, the stage is yours. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Arna. She, her pronouns. And like Rachel mentioned, I'm a freshman at NYU right now. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to kind of share my story about my own struggles with mental health. Um, so my struggles with mental health really began, well, they've always existed, I think, especially when it comes to anxiety, um, which I believe is what we're focusing on more here. I've always been like a big overthinker. Um, 
I've always just like overanalyzed everything and been worried about everything. Um, but like living in India, I lived in India for the first 14 years of like my life. I moved to Portland halfway through my freshman year of high school. Living in India, I didn't have a word for to describe anything I was feeling. India has less to no education around mental health. Um, none of my classes mention mental health or anxiety or mental illness. And so I never really paid attention to any of like my symptoms. It was around eighth grade that they started getting more severe as, you know, as it often happens at that age. And also like making the transition to like high school, getting more competitive in my academics and all of those things were also things that started kind of like triggering my anxiety more. Um, and definitely like moving to the U.S. was a big change for me. And it was something that kind of exacerbated my mental health struggles. Moving here, you know, there was like this different weather um, that I'd never faced before. India is like completely tropical or temperate. And so, um, you know, I've been living like warm, sunny weather my whole life. And then I moved to the Pacific Northwest. Um, and if you don't already know, the Pacific Northwest has like the highest rates of seasonal depression because of the weather especially in Seattle and Portland and I moved in November which is like the peak of seasonal depression time and so my first few months in the U.S. were well full with seasonal depression it was interesting because I moved and obviously we had no friends or family here we moved because of my dad's work he works at Nike and so we just like he just got a different position and we moved so we didn't really have a support system I remember my first Christmas was just like spent at home laying in bed because I hadn't really made any close friends yet and even the ones that I had made had like outstanding plans with other people and that whole just like winter break was just like me laying in the bed of an Airbnb because we didn't even have a house yet because um, we were like waiting to get one we were just like looking for houses because we'd moved halfway across the world um, and so yeah I think like that was the time where my mental health definitely started getting worse and I started noticing more such symptoms and then it just, you know, for the first few years of high school, it just kept getting worse. Like sophomore year was one of the worst for my mental health. Um, so as kind of like a description, not a description, but an understanding of what I have been struggling with, like my anxiety is derivative from my perfectionism. Um, I'm a huge perfectionist and just like living in, a, in the Indian culture and the Asian culture, I'm used to being super competitive, super like just like good at everything. And so I've always been putting that pressure on myself. And so for the longest time, like literally till last year, um, I would value myself based on my accomplishments rather than anything else. Like if I did not get an A plus on a test, then I hated myself. But if I did, I'd be like, okay, you're like, you're cool enough. And so, you know, my relationship with myself was based purely on achievements and accomplishments. I basically didn't have a relationship that was really great with myself for like all, all of high school. And so that was really hard because, you know, obviously I've moved to this new country. I don't have the best support system because I'm still meeting new people and I'm not supporting myself because I'm like being super critical of myself and like beating myself up for not being perfect 100% of the time. And on top of that, when I see myself, this is in the past, I'm talking about myself in the past, when I see myself getting anxious and depressed, I start bottling those emotions. Because living in India, I didn't have a word for any of this. And I still don't at this point. Um, you know, and so I start bottling those emotions, because again, I love being perfect. And so I didn't want any sign of weakness or anything like that. And so I just started bottling a lot of my emotions um and that obviously made things worse and kind of prolonged my struggles and kind of like my journey to healing and it wasn't until one day I was just like hanging out with a friend and he mentioned that like oh yeah I need to take like my anxiety medication and that was the first time I'd heard someone openly mention taking medication for mental illness because and I want to emphasize this again in India no one talked about mental health at all like the tiniest bit and so I was kind of shocked that people were talking about it so openly especially in Portland Oregon I will I don't know um, how it is in other parts of the U.S. but Portland's a fairly like liberal place and everyone's pretty open talking about their struggles which was great for me because I needed to grow in that aspect and so hearing my friend talk about his struggles kind of 
you know, it helped me open up about mine. And then like same time that year, um, I'm super into advocacy and like politic political justice. And so I started volunteering with the peer to peer crisis line in Oregon called the Oregon Youth Line, which just by the way is a great resource because they have like peer to peer volunteers who will pick up your calls and talk to you. And even if you're not in Oregon, you can just reach out to them. Um, so I started volunteering with them and that further helped me because I learned more about like I just got more educated about mental health you know I didn't really know anything so I learned about like coping strategies and I learned about why like how to validate your emotions how not to like invalidate yourself and I learned about how everything I'm feeling is pretty common like it's not a strength or a weak weakness it's just something I'm going through and something I'm gonna have to deal with um and so I learned all of this and it was nice because I met people who were dealing with the same things like the other volunteers there also had like lived experience with um, some kind of mental health struggles and so I would, there was this kind of like bonding and companionship through that and then our supervisors at the crisis line were also super helpful in like teaching us about this and kind of telling us how we can help others while also helping ourselves. And so working with the Oregon Youth Line was what really helped me. And that is what made me reach out to my parents and be like, hey, I think I might need therapy or like at least to see a psychiatrist or a therapist. And that's when I finally got diagnosed with anxiety. Um, I hadn't up until in this point in my life, but I finally did. And then I started seeing a therapist like on and off. Um, and that was also at first it didn't like work out the best I didn't really like therapy I was like I just sit there and talk about my problems I can talk I talk I think about my problems to myself all day you know because I'm an over analyzing type of anxious individual so I just when it comes to processing my anxieties I just keep over analyzing them so when I first started therapy I was like I don't need this I can do this myself like I can literally just over analyze and try to pick apart what's happening and why it's happening myself, even though I don't have a degree in it. Um, and so, yeah, so the first time it didn't really go the best. I stopped going to therapy. And then, but then, you know, senior year came along. Um, the pandemic was hard, but it wasn't as bad as it might have been for some other people. I was relatively fine during the pandemic. But senior year was awful for me because going back to my perfectionism and my high, like my need for high academic achievement, this was the year I'd been waiting for. This was the year where I would finally get into my dream colleges because I'd been working hard. Half of my mental health struggles throughout all of high school was be were because I've been overworking myself and burning myself out. So I have high expectations going into senior year. I have high expectations about where I'm going to get in. Um, and I had the stats, you know, so I'm feeling confident. Like I have a college advisor who's telling me, yeah, you'll probably get into at least a few of your top choices because you do have the stats. Long story short, I get rejected from every single one of my schools, but my safeties. And I end up having to apply to more like in April, the ones who are still accepting rolling applications because I have such less options. Um, and that was like, really confusing for me because I was like that was like I started doubting everything I had ever believed about myself I was like I thought I was a good student like I have gotten other awards and internships and this and that I don't understand why I can't get into college and then going on to social media and seeing people I knew get into those very same colleges and being like just so confused um you know, it was like my biggest dream for like the not even the past four years, even longer, like since middle school, I wanted to go to like certain schools or apply to certain schools. And it had been everything I'd working to where I'd been working towards. So it was definitely heartbreaking. And during this time, I decided I need to start seeing a therapist again because um, it was really hard for me. Uh, for context, I was waitlisted from NYU. So obviously I ended up going to NYU, which I'm very thankful for, but I did not even get in right off the bat. I was waitlisted. Um, and so that was really hard for me, but that was the moment where I decided I needed to work on myself and not, you know, have my worth depend on my achievements. I had to like really self-introspect. I had to sit down and be like, hey, why am I giving this college thing so much importance over me? Um, I do have other signs, other things that tell me I am an accomplished individual. And hey, even if I'm not, I should still love myself unconditionally. Even if no one else 
even if in my mind no one else is loving me I should definitely be loving me because like I kind of have to live with myself for the rest of my life so I might as well you know form a good relationship with myself um and so I kind of started reflecting on the way I was looking at the world and how much pressure I was putting on myself um and honestly I think it worked out for the best I wouldn't be I wouldn't want to be anywhere else I really like it here at NYU and but yeah so I went back to therapy and you know I ended up like doing it for a long time um and then I had a gap semester so since I got off the wait list at NYU I had to like they put me in a gap they put like I just started at NYU a month ago and so they took me off the wait list and said hey we're gonna get get you into school as a spring admin so without again I wouldn't say against my will but I had an unplanned gap semester which wasn't the best because it was hard to see all of my friends go off to college um, and start like living their best lives, making new friends in new places while I was just sitting at home. It was not the best feeling because I didn't want to gap semester. I had been waiting for college for four years. This was like my time. But, you know, I ended up with a gap semester. Um, a part of me at first when I heard that I was taking I was going to be taking a gap semester was like hey maybe I can travel I love traveling um, but I couldn't because of some of my stuff some stuff with like my green card procedure I needed to stay in the U.S. Um, and I didn't really I wasn't really interested in traveling within the U.S. I wanted to more go abroad um, so yeah I ended up just staying at home and it was really like my mental health definitely worsened for a while especially my relationship with like social media because like going on social media and seeing everyone posting about like their new lives at college their new friends seeing people from NYU post because obviously as soon as I got into NYU I started following people from NYU so seeing people from NYU and New York post and feeling that like fear of missing out or that left outness was definitely like really hard it like every time I went on Instagram during those three months I would like start getting jitters like I would start feeling the anxiety in my body um and so I obviously went through therapy all of, throughout that semester I really needed it but I was able to work through some of those issues and obviously those issues were just reflective of deeper insecurities like even though it was harder for me to deal with social media and like people posting certain things during that time that wasn't like anything new you know I feel like we all have that and so I kind of like learned to kind of be like hey I need to start living life for myself and not for other people and not pay attention what, to what others are doing um, and then I finally moved here and I was so excited because again this is what I've been waiting for and so I moved here and I haven't had I haven't found a new therapist here in New York yet I honestly haven't had um like time or anything to find one but you know and it's been I I it's been a little bit harder than I thought it would be because you know I've been dreaming about this for so long I thought it would just be like magical the minute I got here but just like meeting new people not having a set support system has definitely like um made it hard but I've definitely like learned to have those coping mechanisms and just kind of deal with my struggles by myself um and so yeah that's that's my story thank you so so much arna wonderful for sharing your story with us it was it's such an uh, amazing story and and we're so glad that you are um in a good place so um i am thrilled to welcome lynn lyons who is going to share with us some wonderful content and strategies Thank you, Rachel. Arna, thank you so much for being open enough and courageous enough to come in front of these people that um, can really benefit from hearing what it's like. The story that Arna is telling is very typical, and I think she was so articulate um, in describing it. Um, one of the things, if I were to just to think about the things I'd really want you to hear from what Arna is saying, um, when you move to a new place, I mean, she had all her perfectionism, which she, she was aware of. When you move to a new place and you don't have social connections and you don't have friends and you don't really even have a permanent home, I don't care if you're living in Miami or Portland, that is tough. So I'm not gonna give, I'm not gonna give rainy Portland too much credit because that's a really difficult situation to come into. And then the other thing I think that is really important that Arna said is that when she first went to therapy, 
she said, you know, why would I go to therapy and just talk about my problems? Why would I go to therapy and just be telling somebody, yeah, you know, because as yeah, she said, I can do this by myself, which is such a, an interesting thing for Arne to say, because I say that all the time. <laughs> I say to people, look, if you're going to go to therapy, you need to be learning things. You need to be active. You need to have homework assignments. Don't pay somebody to, to talk in a way that you could talk to your best friend or even to yourself. So I'm, I, it was wonderful to hear Arna said that when she went back the second time, and, and I wrote it down, Arna, because it was because you said it so well. You said you started to look at the way I was looking at the world. What, what were your beliefs? What was going on inside of you that then you were seeing the world through your eyes? Because one of the things about anxiety is that it is referred to as internalizing disorder, which means that we do the bulk of the work inside. People think, and, and it's with depression and anxiety, because depression is also an internalizing disorder. People will say, well, it's, it's this stuff out here that caused it to happen. And listen to Arna's story. She moved, she moved halfway across the world. She started in a new school. Eighth grade is hard enough as it is. Starting high school is hard enough as it is. But it was really what she was bringing from the inside out that was causing her such dismay. And what she learned was, how do I see myself and see the world through different eyes? Or how do I make those adjustments? So just a wonderful way of articulating that, that therapy is not going and talking about your problems. Therapy is going and seeing what patterns, what perspectives, what stories you have to shift. And that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight as we talk about how to help our, our teens, how to help our girls, how do we help develop the skills that kids and teenagers and adults actually need in order to move forward in the world? So I'm gonna bring up my um, screen for you. Hang on one sec while I do this. Hang on, hang on. I'm just lifting up my camera so I can see. All right, there we go. I'll pop in and out of the out of the uh, screen share if I'm going to go on a particularly uh, long rant about something. All right, so no need to tell everybody that this has been a, a, a pretty bumpy two years for us, but I just want to set the record straight because I'm hearing a lot about the crisis and mental health and the pandemic and the pandemic and the crisis and the crisis and the pandemic. Prior to March 2020, when everything sort of fell apart, the mental health numbers were not so great. So we were seeing a pretty steady increase in anxiety, depression, teen suicide. This pandemic certainly hasn't made things better. And I've got some statistics to tell you about um, as, we, as we go along. The problem from my perspective with what, well, there's a lot of problems actually, but one of the problems when it comes to anxiety is that a lot of what we teach kids, a lot of what we talk about, a lot of what schools do when we're dealing with anxiety actually supports the disorder. Not on purpose. Nobody is, nobody is saying, hey, I have an idea. Let, let's make kids more anxious. No parent that I meet with says, well, we have this plan, right? We wanted to, we wanted to get going, we want to make our kids anxious. And look, we did a great job. That's not how this thing works. But our culture, our expectations and the things that we are teaching kids right now about anxiety, a lot of them are backwards. They're intuitive, they feel good, they work in the short term, but in the long term, we are now reaping what we have sown over the past 20 years, I would say. And we have a, a, a group of young people that are really struggling with their emotional management, really struggling with, with their emotional health. So here's what anxiety is all about. One of the things that is so important to me is that I simplify this thing, I demystify this thing. I don't use a lot of psychobabble diagnostic terms. I know what they mean, I can speak that language. But regardless of what category of anxiety disorder you have, or even how you're describing your anxiety, this is what anxiety wants. Anxiety wants certainty and comfort, period. If we have a diagnostic category, that 
helps me understand what you worry about. If you're socially anxious, that means you are really concerned with judgment. If you are, if you have generalized anxiety disorder, that means you'll just worry about anything that comes across your screen. You're an equal opportunity worrier. If you have a specific phobia, that means that that's the content. I am not all that concerned with what you worry about. But what I am concerned with is how you generate the worry. How do you do that? Anxiety says, as long as I can have certainty in life, as long as I can know exactly what's going to happen, I'm good. As long as I feel comfortable as I'm moving forward, I'm good. And what happens in families is that you start working for the anxiety disorder. I refer to it as a cult leader, C-U-L-T. The cult leader shows up and the cult leader says, all right, here are my demands. This is what you need to do. Think of Arna's story. Uh, Arna, Arna's perfectionism was her cult leader. And it had very strict rules that she was supposed to follow. And if she didn't meet those expectations, if she didn't follow those rules, she was merciless with herself. This is what happens with anxiety in families. And what happens is the anxiety says, look, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And, and people listen. Why do people listen? Because you gotta get to bed, you gotta get to work, you gotta get to school. Kids don't wanna feel distressed. Parents don't wanna feel distressed. So you start seeking certainty and comfort. I know for a fact, because I am in schools all the time talking about this, that one of the ways that, that schools have been dealing with anxiety for a long time, families too, is to say, let's see if we can make things as certain and comfortable as possible. So a uh, student is having difficulty going into school and everybody gets together and they have a meeting and they say, all right, so she needs to know exactly what's going to happen. We're going to come up with a plan so that, so that everything goes exactly as it needs to go according to the anxiety disorder. And everybody says, oh, good. This will calm things down. And the anxiety disorder says, thank you so much for doing my bidding. This is where we are with a lot of this. So what we want to pay attention to is, is what are the skills that kids need? What are the skills that our, that our young people need in order to manage when life doesn't go as planned? When we look at kids who then become teenagers, who then become adults, when we look at the skills they don't have, if they are raised in an anxious environment, here are the four things that we see all the time. Kids raised in anxious environments are lousy at tolerating uncertainty. They're not so great independent problem solvers. They don't score very well on the autonomy scales when we look at autonomy and, and that sense of mastery and independence. And they perceive the world as a more dangerous place than kids that are not raised in anxious environments. If you are raised in an anxious environment and this thing is generational, this thing is passed down, there is some genetic push to it, but a lot of it is based on social modeling. If you are raised in an anxious environment, one of the things we know is that an unchecked, an untreated, an unacknowledged anxiety disorder is one of the top predictors of developing depression by the time you hit adolescence or young adulthood, which is what Arna was experiencing. So we have to begin to turn this thing around. We have to begin to change the paradigm. The thing about anxiety is that the more that we say, I can't feel this way, I shouldn't have these feelings, oh no, oh no, why am I experiencing these symptoms, these anxiety symptoms, the more we try and get rid of it, the stronger it gets. So any strategy, any coping strategy, that is based on trying to get rid of anxiety and even almost more importantly, to get rid of worry is going to make the problem worse. My friend Reed, who I wrote two of my books with, Reed Wilson, he's brilliant. He describes anxiety this way. Anxiety is having a thought, a feeling, a sensation, a lot of them normal, that you want to resist. It is the resisting it is the, why am I feeling this way? 
It is the getting anxious about being anxious. It's all of that pushing back. That's what gives this thing legs. So when I talk about what I wanna teach kids and what I want them to understand and what I want families to understand, it's really about demystifying, as I said, giving language to it as Arna learned as well, and then being able to see what are the patterns that we need to shift? What are the things that we want to do differently? Because every time we say we can't feel this way, we have to get rid of it. Not only do we develop coping strategies that are based on sort of, oh, I can't feel this way, but then we, we often put our teenagers at risk of, of trying to self-medicate and get rid of it. If we are doing the disorder, this is a phrase I use all the time. If we are doing the disorder, it means we are working for the anxiety to create certainty and comfort in the absence of skill building. So let's talk about skills. In, in my therapy practice, it's really all about skills. Uh, also, just so you know, I don't see children or teens. I don't, I don't see kids, whatever size and age they are. I don't see them alone. Once you get teenagery, then you're going to probably come by yourself. The, the rule of thumb in my office is if you can drive to your appointment by yourself, you can come to your appointment by yourself. But it makes absolutely no sense to me that you would have somebody who is eight or 10 or 12 or 14, and I would bestow all of this information that I have about anxiety and worry to this young person and not include the parents in the process. But it happens all the time. It happens all the time. So this is about families. This is about developing skills. And this is also about thinking preventatively. Start early, I say, the earlier the better, but it's never too late. This was from an article that was in the Atlantic um, Magazine in 2014. It was an article, a big feature article on anxiety in schools. And this is a quote from that article. This was a school counselor. And this is what this person said. It's hard to take preventative action against anxiety. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, right? So here we have, this is a school counselor saying it's hard to take preventative action. It's not, it's not. It may be hard work, but it's not complicated. We know the patterns that contribute to anxiety. It is not a mystery. We know how it shows up. We know how it gets stronger and we know the patterns that reinforce it. And thus, of course, we know the patterns that, that can dilute its power, that can take away its power. So when somebody says to me, or I, when I read, you can't really take preventative action, right? I, I think, well, person doesn't know what they're talking about. Let me tell you, let me go through some of the things that, that we can do as we're thinking about prevention. I'm gonna talk about the preventative patterns that, that teens need to learn. Kids can learn them too. We're, we're focusing on teenagers. So I'm gonna focus on teenagers. I'm gonna talk about the key role of parents, how it's so important that you recognize the generational patterns of this and what you might be doing, not on purpose, of course, it's not about blame, but it is about responsibility, what you might be doing to continue modeling worry and anxiety in your family. And then I'll talk a little bit about schools if we have time. So in the broadest way, as we're talking about what we want to teach, we really want to think about, think about it in terms of emotional management. So just as my pal Reed said, right, step one, you're going to have a thought, a feeling, a sensation. Step two, what are you going to do about that? How are you going to respond and react? What voices inside of you are you going to listen to? What, what is going to influence you? When you are angry, we're all going to feel angry. We're all going to feel anxious. We're all going to feel overwhelmed at times. What is your response to it? That's what I do every day. And when I am working with a child, a teenager, an adult, when I'm working with a family, I am always asking the question, what are the resources that I have to work with? What are the, what are the, the things that this family has? Are they, are they warm? Do they have a good sense of humor? Are they hard workers? Um, are they creative? And where is the gap? What are the skills that I need to teach? It doesn't take me a long time to figure out where the gaps are because anxiety is incredibly redundant. There's three qualities of anxiety, actually. It's predictable, 
It's predictable. It shows up in times of uncertainty. It shows up when you don't know exactly what's going to happen. It shows up when the pressure is on. It is predictable. It is redundant. It says the same thing over and over and over again. And it's persistent. It shows up. It comes back. It doesn't give up easy. It gets stronger when we try and get rid of it. It gets weaker when we acknowledge its existence, when we normalize it, and when we take away all of the pathological language that, that we've been uh, using over the last several years. So let me go through these patterns. The first is flexibility versus rigidity. If we look at anxiety, anxiety is rigid. Now, not everybody who's rigid is anxious. Some people are just rigid. Some people are just controlling. Some people just want things to go their way. But most people who are anxious are rigid. So what, what, what as Arna was saying, right, things have to go a certain way. When you are anxious, it's as if you're watching, uh, it's, it's as, if, as if you're living your life walking on a tightrope. One false step and whoo, down you go. I want you to live your life as if you're walking across the Brooklyn Bridge where you've got room, right? There's boundaries. We can't go too far in one direction or the other, but anxiety is rigid. Anxiety says, this is how things have to go. And if they don't go the way that I want them to go, if they don't go the way that I imagine they need to go, if they don't go the way that I intend them to go, if they don't go the way that I hope that they'll go, I can't handle it. So flexibility does not mean getting rid of structure or expectations or boundaries or planning. All the planning that Rachel and I did for, for me to be here this evening, right? We don't, just, we don't just get rid of it. We don't just see what happens when I travel. I just don't show up at the airport and hope that there's a flight for me. Planning, preparing, expectations, boundaries. But flexibility means managing when things don't follow that plan. And the way we make anxiety worse is that we buy into this idea that to make anxiety better, we make sure we have more plans. We have more preparations. We have more rigidity. If we are talking about developing the ability, both in ourselves and in our relationships to manage what life throws at us, I am really paying attention to the level of rigidity versus flexibility. Arna's story was an evolution of a young woman from being incredibly rigid to managing all sorts of things that she really didn't have a lot of control over, managing all sorts of things and over and over and over again, coping and adjusting and adapting to the place where now she is a freshman at NYU figuring out this whole new life. So despite the fact that she had this perfectionism, this rigidity, clearly what she's learned is how do I flexibly deal with what life throws at me? And how do I flexibly deal with myself? Because I cannot be this rigid person, this uncooked piece of spaghetti. So that's the first pattern, flexibility versus rigidity. The second pattern that we want to pay attention to is global versus parts. When I'm talking about global, I'm talking about what's referred to as a global attributional style, fancy term that basically says you paint the world with a broad brush. People are global, tend to be pretty all or nothing about things. So they use these big global words. They use words like never and nobody and always and everything. I always have bad luck. Nothing ever goes my way. I'll never figure this out. When people are global, oftentimes, that is a sign that they're feeling overwhelmed. You've had this experience, I'm sure. You've looked at some huge mess that's in your basement or some huge project you have to do, and you just you, and you go, oh, I will, I will never get this done. I don't even know where to start. How will I ever complete this? Or you're having a really lousy day, and you're feeling overwhelmed, and you said, you know, nothing ever goes my way. The opposite of global, the corollary to global, is not seeing things in these all or nothing terms, not seeing these things in, in black or white terms, or judging circumstances, or judging yourself through these, these words, but breaking things down into parts. The opposite of global is parts. If you are dealing with, if you are feeling particularly anxious, if, you're, if your teenager is feeling particularly anxious, 
then sequencing is an enormously important skill to have. Recognizing that things have a beginning and a middle and an end, breaking things down into parts. So I'm gonna handle this part and this part, the ability to compartmentalize when necessary. We can go too far with that and sort of shut ourselves off completely from parts of ourselves. But there are certain times when it's really important to say, you know what, this feeling that I have or my desire to be on TikTok for three hours or my, my, uh, the, the irritation I feel at having to do this assignment, I'm gonna just tuck those feelings away over here in this part because there's a job that needs to be done. Being able to break things down is the opposite of global and also being able to recognize all the different parts of you is the opposite of global. One of the things that is really problematic right now is the way that I hear teenagers talking about themselves as if their, their diagnosis is their identity. When we take the identity of I have depression, I'm an anxious person, I'm a perfectionist. And when we centralize it, which means that we make that our predominant characteristic, that means that we are continuing to view ourselves and the world through that perspective. I'm an anxious person, I'm an insomniac, I'm a this, I'm a that. And we will take in data and we will, we will do the work on the inside and we will conform to that identity. Anxiety and depression are not lifelong diseases. I don't even like calling them, uh, you know, I, I'm really just not a fan even of the term mental illness. Being anxious, going through a period of depression, having difficulty that you may need help for, that we should be able to talk about is a wonderful thing, but we have gone so far in, in terms of this is my identity, this is who I am, and in the pathologizing language in a global way that it's hurting our young people. So do you have a part of you that gets anxious? Sure, do I have a part of me that gets anxious? Yes, I do. I do not do very well with medical stuff, in particular bones. It's a long story. There's all sorts of <laughs> videos of me talking about it. Do I have a part of me that's super competitive? I do actually. But I don't bring out that part when I'm sitting with an anxious six-year-old, six right? So, so being able to break things down into parts, being able to recognize that you are made up of all sorts of different parts, that jobs and people and circumstances are all broken up rather than this global, this is who I am. So um, we know that that a global attributional style, which means that all or nothing thinking, that black and white thinking, that global perspective, huge, very predictable risk factor for both anxiety and depression. So you wanna pay attention to that. The language gives it away. You can listen to that language with your teenager and you can talk to them about it. A, a silly example is that when my boys were little, if they were mad at me, uh, I, have, I have two sons, um, they're um, 23 and 21 now. Um, uh, but when they were little and they were mad at me, they would say, you never let us have any fun. And I would say, I never, I never let you have any fun. And I trained him up to say, right now in this minute, you are not letting us have fun. And I would say, that, that is a true statement. Right now in this minute, I am not letting you have the fun you wanna have. So paying attention to that. The next pattern is the pattern of catastrophizing. Catastrophic thinking means that you focus on the worst case scenario. So somebody who's catastrophic, when they're thinking about what they're gonna do, where they're gonna go, what airplane they're gonna get on, whether or not they're gonna have this for dinner or that for dinner, they go to the worst case scenario. They imagine the worst outcome. There is something called catastrophic parenting. Catastrophic parenting means that even when you're thinking about what your kids are going to do, or you're articulating and conversing with your kids about what they're gonna do, you talk about bad outcomes. Catastrophic parents give a safety instruction and it's totally fine to give a safety instruction, you know, make sure you put your helmet on when you ride your bike or make sure you, uh, you know, whatever, to hang on to your sister's hand when you cross the street. Perfectly fine to give a safety instruction. What a catastrophic parent does is then say, and let me tell you why and then proceeds to give all of the scary things that could happen. 
even if you're not doing it out loud and you're doing it in your head, that is a horrible way to go through life. Just imagining the worst outcome, but this is what catastrophic people do. So this is why everybody from this day forward, you are not gonna say anymore, get rid of this. What's the worst that could happen, right? People say that all the time. What's the worst that could happen? And you know who responds to that? The anxiety says, hey, pick me, I know. That's what kept me up until two in the morning, thinking about the worst that could happen. Remember, one of those qualities that the research shows one of the outcomes of kids raised in anxious environments is they perceive the world as a more dangerous place than kids not raised in anxious environments. If you perceive the world as in a dangerous way, if you perceive the world as a dangerous place, granted, there are lots of things about the world that are dangerous. The pandemic gave us a good example of that. There are many things actually that aren't more dangerous than they have been for years and years, including, for example, stranger abductions right? Hasn't changed since the 70s. But if you are somebody who perceives the world as a dangerous place, and if you as a parent are consistently talking to your kids about what could go wrong, about the harms that could befall them, you are getting in the way of them developing an enormously important skill for moving through life. And that is the ability to assess reasonable risk. In the extreme, if you've got somebody who's super anxious and super catastrophic and they can't assess risk, the whole world is dangerous, these are the people that don't leave their house. If you are somebody who can't assess reasonable risk, it means that, that you're not gonna get on an airplane. You'll get in your car, because it's not rational, by the way. You'll get in your car, but you won't get on an airplane. You'll say to me, and a lot of people have said to me, I don't, I'm afraid to fly, so I'm going to drive to Orlando for spring break, right? That's not an assessment of reasonable risk. So when we talk about catastrophic thinking, when I talk about catastrophic parenting, it is so, so essential that if you are in a family that talks about danger all the time, if you do what I call safety chatter, if you are careful, Kathy, right? Oh, watch out. Don't do this. Be blah, 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 blah right, then you are setting yourself up and you are setting your family up for anxiety. That's how this thing works. Catastrophic thinking is not problem solving. Catastrophic thinking is creating that scary movie in your head about what might happen and living as if it already is. Worry is about projecting into the future and imagining horrible things happening the reason that you get symptoms from that is because the worry that you're doing up here in your prefrontal cortex fires off your amygdala. Your poor amygdala thinks that you're being chased by a tiger and it gets your body ready for danger. Worry is the process that happens up here in the prefrontal cortex. Anxiety technically refers to the physical symptoms that are triggered when your uh, amygdala fires off, your fight or flight system fires off, not because of danger, but because of anticipation of, because of imagining. Fear is fear. We need this fight or flight system. We want it to go off. When we're in danger, we want it to go off to protect us. It's, we're hardwired to do that. Anxiety is, is, an, is well, as David Barlow, who grad, uh, was the uh, head of the Boston University Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders, David Barlow said, anxiety is an overestimation of the problem and an underestimation of your resources to deal with it. So pay attention to this catastrophic thinking, this catastrophic language. Never in the history of my being a therapist, which is a long time, has anybody come to me and said, you know what, I worried all the time. I worried about, about you know, maybe uh, I worried about getting cancer. I was so worried about getting cancer. I, you know, checked my skin all the time. I went to the doctor. If I had any kind of headache or my eye twitched, I was always on WebMD. I was just, just terrified that I was going to get cancer. Worried about it every day for 10 years. And then at the end of those 10 years, I got diagnosed with cancer. Nobody has ever said, oh my gosh, the day I got diagnosed with cancer, so easy, easy peasy. Because all those years of worrying just made this day a breeze. No one has ever said that catastrophizing and worrying are not problem solving. They are internal processes. They get in the way of you stepping out in the world and it just makes you more and more beholden to the cult leader that says, remember, I need to know exactly what's gonna happen and I need to feel certain as I do it. 
All right. So we've got rigidity versus flexibility. We've got global versus parts. We've got catastrophic versus being able to problem solve and assess reasonable risk. The next one we want to talk about, and this is critical for teenagers, is permanent versus temporary. If you have a permanent mindset, some, you know, Carol Dweck referred to the fixed mindset, it's really that things aren't going to change, that you aren't going to change. This is, again, where that diagnostic language, where all the mental health awareness that we've been trying to do, although I think we're not doing such a good job because the message is, this is who I am. This is a lifelong disease. This is the way my brain is wired. I have a chemical imbalance. All of that, not only is it fairly inaccurate based on what we know in terms of the treatment of these things, but all of that gets in the way of believing, of hoping, of doing the work that you are capable of changing. When you have a permanent mindset, when you say, you know what, nothing's going to change, this is the way things are going to be, then why, why would you do anything? So when we think about how anxiety moves into depression, why is it that anxiety is such a predictor of depression in the adolescent years? It's because they get to the point of why bother? Being anxious all the time is exhausting. Being a perfectionist is exhausting. The pressure you put on yourself, worrying about things all the time is exhausting. And if you believe that that's not going to change, if you don't have the hope or the skills or the support to change that, you're going to get to the place of why bother. And why bother is the, is the calling card of depression. The opposite of this permanent mindset is something that in the research is called positive expectancy, which quite simply is the belief that things can change. When we look at the research on positive expectancy, when we are looking at how people heal from things, whether it is from cancer or grief or back surgery or anxiety or depression, positive expectancy is a critical factor in people being able to move forward. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? But when we say to kids, this is who you are, when we support that label, when we don't give them the skills and the strategies to move forward, when we focus on things that are designed to avoid and eliminate and create certainty, we are doing the disorder and we are making the problem worse. Brains are incredibly malleable. They are changing all the time. The, the malleability of our brain is something that, that was very um, not, not well understood you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, not understood at all. In the last 10, 20 years, the, the discoveries that we've had about what the brain is capable of doing are really, are really fascinating. Norman Dodge, D-I-O-D-G-E, dodgeball with an I in it, has written two books. One is called The Brain That Changes Itself. The other, which I'm listening to um, now, but I totally space out on the title. I can't remember it. But he is a researcher. He is, a, he is a, a, um, an, an incredibly interesting guy who talks about the amazing things that the brain does. When we are talking about positive expectancy, we are offering to our teenagers the belief that things can change. When we offer them instead a disease model that says, this is genetic, this is who you are, you've got this thing, we are offering them the opposite of that. And we really need to pay attention to our language about that because it's pervasive and because they believe it. How do they know? How do I know they believe it? Because they tell me all the time they believe it. And they get pissed at me when I uh, try and tell them otherwise, although I'm not going to shut up about it. Um, so in terms of, you know, how do I go about helping to, to support this, this malleable mindset, this changeable brain, this is just some examples of things that I might do in therapy. Therapy, therapy for me is an active process. It's about learning. It's about skill building. You wouldn't take your kid to a piano teacher if the uh, piano teacher said, well, when they come for their piano lesson, we're going to sit and talk about playing the piano, but absolutely no practicing of the piano between, between lessons, right? I don't want them to touch the piano. You would say, uh, this is kind of weird. I don't think I'm going to bring this person, I'm not going to bring my kid back to his piano teacher, but it happens with therapy all the time. 
when I say to parents, well, what are you working on? What are the homework assignments? What are the skills that you're building? They're like, mm, I don't know. Or they'll say, well, it's not that kind of therapy. Therapy is an active process because we learn experientially. So asking a, asking a young person, give me five ways that you've changed in the last two years, right? Arna would be able to do that like that. She listed them for us. A success journal. I am not interested in having kids keep track of all the things they worry about, having them write down all their worries. But what I will, because the content of it doesn't really matter to me. I'm not so interested in what you worry about. I'm interested in how worry shows up right? I externalize it. I give it a name. What does it say? What does it do? What are the demands that it makes upon you? I am interested in having uh, people keep track of when the worry showed up, how did you interact with it differently? When that, when that pattern arrived, when your perfectionism showed up, when your catastrophic thinking showed up, when you started ruminating and worrying about something, how did you pull it out how did you create some distance and how did you respond differently to it? It's also very interesting when we ask teenagers, you know, you can say, so give me, give me a list of the things that people used to believe that we now know are just crazy or ridiculous. Give me a list of, of how over history in terms of science, in terms of medicine, in terms of, in terms of all sorts of things, things that people were sure of that now we question. My, my mentor uh, said, said to me, uh, there is nothing more dangerous than somebody who is real sure and real wrong. And again, that goes back to rigidity. That goes, you know, these, these, these patterns overlap for sure. This is a great resource for your teenager. Um, so this stands, this is the National Institute for the Clinical Application of Behavioral Medicine, which is a mouthful. Um, but if you go on their website, they have a bunch of free infographics. So NICAM does a ton of um, continuing education for my field. So they have a lot of programs that, that, uh, uh, you know, on, on everything from anxiety to ADHD to trauma to all that kind of stuff where they get people to do programs. I've done a bunch of work for them. But if you go on their website, you'll see the infographic and you'll see this one on neuroplasticity. There's a black and white version that you can just download a printable version, but it's really interesting. And it gives a lot of great information about the malleability of the brain and, and how we're always changing. When we think about neuroplasticity, we really wanna talk about how the brain is capable of making new connections, and then certainly how it's capable of finding the same path over and over and over again. If you are a worrier, your, your worry path, man, that's a well-worn path, right? That, that you just go right down that path. How do we change the path? How do we begin to question our own thinking? How do we begin to do the opposite of what the worry demands? This is why avoidance is backfiring. It backfires. How do we step into situations where the worry will show up so that we can begin to lay down some new track? That's flexibility. That's malleability. That's, that's really what we're looking for. The next pattern that we want to pay attention to is being internally focused. Now, remember I said earlier that um, anxiety and depression are both referred to as internalizing disorders because we do the bulk of the work on the inside. And what we know is that when people are externally connected, when even more specifically they're doing things that they would consider meaningful work or meaningful connection, that is a huge preventative factor and a curative factor for anxiety and depression. When people get depressed and when they stay depressed, a lot of it has to do with isolation and disconnection. Let me give you um, a, a little uh, information here. So um, um, one of the things that's, you, I don't know if your high schools have it, probably, I mean, a lot of high schools have it right now, is that they add the community service component. They add vo volunteerism. Volunteerism with teenagers is so effective in treating depression and depression and anxiety hang out. So effective in treating depression that there are a group of researchers that are saying, instead of just having this as sort of an adjunct, like, you know, when kids are depressed, we should, we should make sure that they're, you know, maybe volunteering. It should be a part of treatment protocols. 
that it should be emphasized as an essential part of kids moving out of this. You know, I, I couldn't have asked for a more helpful story than Arna's story because as she's talking, I'm like, there it is, there it is, there it is. You know what made her feel really better when she was in a high school? Is that she started working with that outreach program. She started helping other people. She started connecting to people who could relate to what she was talking about. She started, she started feeling as if she was doing meaningful work. That was enormously helpful to her. Such a good example of that. Um, just so you know, during the pandemic, there was some research that was done. Um, that, so the, the gathering tons of data and information, there was one group, a uh, chunk of data that they gathered that was for 11 to 14 year olds. They looked at it at the beginning, right, right in like May of 2020, and then again in August of 2020. And they were really looking at what were the things that were predicting better mental health, better emotional management, and what were the things that were predicting worse outcomes, particularly with this group. One of the things they found, not surprisingly, because the, the statistics say this consistently, is that girls were struggling more than boys. During the pandemic and during, during the lockdown, the, the boys, they were getting hit with it, but girls were suffering more. Girls were struggling more. It was very clear that that was one of the differences. Uh, the other difference that they found during the pandemic was that if you had pre-existing anxiety, the cracks became chasms. That's what I saw um, and heard over and over again. If you had pre-existing anxiety and you hadn't learned skills or you weren't actively working to deal with it, cracks became chasms. So pre-existing untreated uh, problems. And the other thing that they found, which will surprise none of you, is increased screen time. So during the pandemic, if you were a girl with some pre-existing anxiety and you were hanging aloud on, on, on screens, on social media, things weren't going so well for you. When we look at what was going on before the pandemic, those things line up too. Kids that are isolated, kids that are disconnected, the work of Jean Twenge, T-W-E-N-G-E, -E, Jean Twenge, she has been looking, she looks at generational patterns and things that, that go on. She has, has been very clear that there is a correlation. We, we can look at some causation, but there is a correlation between increased screen time and rates of depression and anxiety in, in our teenagers. So you want to pay attention to that. Um, here's, what, here's what we know helped. And again, this is not just in the pandemic. There is something I'm sure some of you have probably heard about ACEs, which is adverse, child, adverse childhood experiences, ACEs. There's also, they look at positive childhood experiences, doesn't get as much press. One a group of researchers looked at what were the positive childhood experiences that would predict even if you had a heavy ACE score, so you had gone through those lists of things that, that you know, um, a, a divorce, a death of a parent, some sort of trauma, abuse, poverty, all of those things. If you had a few of these, these were very predictive of you doing much better as an adult when we were looking at mental health and in particular depression scores. The things that we look at in terms of the positives have to do with, let me just give you the list. Being able to talk to your family about what's going on inside of you, being able to express your emotions, letting people know what you're feeling. Feeling that their family stood by them during difficult times. So having that support, that loving support of a family, even when things were going rough. Being able to enjoy and participate in community traditions. Now, when you think about the pandemic, a lot of that stuff went away, which was really difficult for kids. Having a sense of belonging in high school, not including those who didn't, didn't attend high school for some reason or uh, were homeschooled, but again, pandemic, right? Having a sense of belonging in high school. You don't have to have a ton of friends in high school. You, you can do very well if you have a few friends, but it's a sense that you belong. 
the adolescent brain is, is wired for connection and belonging because way back when, that's how you survived. So we know developmentally that's what they're doing. Um, this is a really critical one, I think. At least two non-parent adults that took a genuine interest in them. So a teacher, a coach, an aunt, a grandparent who really saw them for who they were and took a great interest in them and also feeling safe and protected by an adult in their home. If you had any of those, they did more than equalize the adverse childhood experiences. They actually boosted you up above, very powerful stuff. So think about those things in your family. And then here's some research that they found during the pandemic specifically, in this group of 11 to 14 year olds, where we know that the girls are at greater risk, these are the things that they found that were preventative. This, is, this was the emotional inoculation that kids had. One, family connection and routines. There it is again, right? Feeling connected, having routines in your family. Peer connection, of course. Social media is not peer connection. Social media supports social comparison, but it's not to be mistaken for true peer connection, which was difficult during the pandemic, but for kids who were able to maintain that on some level, they did better. Sleep was super important and it continues to be super important. All of these things are super important. If I am looking at school avoidance, school refusal, one of, and, and this is one of the questions I ask with all of the families that come in to see me, I say, how's bedtime? What's bedtime like? What's your sleep like? School refusal, school avoidance, I see a huge correlation of difficulty at bedtime, difficulty falling asleep, inconsistent routines, kids staying up too late, sleep, 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 right? We need sleep. And then the other thing, which I say all the time, people don't like to, you know, there's a lot of stuff here that is really not rocket science, but people just don't wanna accept it. Physical activity. So during the pandemic, kids that were connected to their families, had strong peer connections, got enough sleep, which during the pandemic, actually a lot of kids got more sleep and engaged in physical activity did better. There's a lot that we can learn from just going back to the basics. Again, my job is to simplify, 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 not to complicate. All right. So if you've got questions, um, go ahead and pop them into the chat and Rachel will, will feed them to me. Um, we'll, we'll get to those in just a minute. So I'm giving you your warning. Now's the time to put in your questions if you wanna put in your questions. These are just in terms of social stuff. These are some of the things that I am focusing on in when, I'm, when I'm working with, with teenagers. These are the social skills that sometimes we lose track of, but that are really, really helpful. You know, having appropriate boundaries, knowing when a relationship isn't working, knowing, knowing when you want to say enough is enough. Uh, the corollary to that, too, is I don't think we spend enough time with teenage girls talking about relationship repair. So that if you have a falling out with a friend or you have a conflict, really helping to coach our, our, our girls through how do we how do we apologize? How do we take responsibility? How do we get out of the blame game? How do we see things from other people's perspective? How do we repair a relationship that is meaningful to us? By, oh, I spelled empathy wrong. By awkward empathy, I murdered that word. By awkward empathy, I mean teaching girls and boys too, teaching young people how to have difficult conversations in, in difficult circumstances. And the reason I call it awkward empathy is because it just it just doesn't feel good. So uh, you you have a friend who's gone through a tough time. You have a, a, a friend who who just had their dog die or you just found out that their mom was diagnosed with cancer or that the parents are going through a tough breakup or something like that. We want kids to be to learn how to say to somebody, hey, I heard that you're going through a tough time. I just want to let you know I'm thinking about you. People, adults do this all the time. They'll say, well, I didn't want to bring it up. I didn't, I didn't want to remind him of it, right? If your dog just died, if your mom had cancer, if your parents are going through a divorce, believe me, you're thinking about it. So I really want to teach kids that skill of connection, that skill of reaching out, that skill of feeling uncomfortable, but saying, 
you know, like I, I, I heard what happened and I don't need to talk to you about it so much, but I'm here if you want to talk, but I just want to let you know, connection, 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 connection. Emotional literacy is the ability to put words to your feelings. The emotional literacy is to be able to go inside and say, this is what I'm feeling and to be able to express that somehow. Some kids do it better through art or music, but being able to know what's going on inside of you versus trying to deny, trying to smush it away, trying to um, uh, get rid of it, right? Any of those elimination strategies. So these are the critical skills. Self-disclosure, how do you know when to keep something to yourself versus when to disclose it? The way I talk to girls about it, I say, say look, you've got some information that you're gonna share. I want you to think about it as a little tiny bird, little tiny chick. Who are you gonna give that little tiny bird to? I only want you to give that little tiny bird to somebody who you know is gonna take care of that little tiny bird. Don't be sharing your little tiny bird with everybody willy nilly, they're not gonna take care of it. We want to teach girls about that uh, from, from an early age. I said this, isolation is a red flag. If you've, if, if you've got a teenager, it is normal for them to not want to spend a super amount of time with you. That's fine. They like to spend time in their room, talking to their friends, doing whatever. But if you notice a, a big shift or even a medium shift that they are no longer doing the activities that they used to do, that they're avoiding more, that, that you notice changes um, in the way that they're interacting with their peers in particular, that's something to pay attention to. This is a time, adolescence is a time of connection. And when that gets interrupted and when they're not capable of doing that, it's going to be problematic. This is why anxiety, when anxiety, when we don't do anything about anxiety, when we, when we don't pay attention to it, this is why it is so easily moves into depression because anxiety does not care at all whether or not your daughter tries out for the play, whether or not she gets her driver's license, whether or not she volunteers at the animal shelter, whether or not she uh, goes to the sleepover, whether or not she gets a part-time job at the grocery store. Anxiety doesn't care. Anxiety says, I'm out. Anxiety says, no, thank you. And when you are an adolescent and you are developmentally mandated to connect and anxiety comes in and says, don't do it, that's where we get into trouble. So you really want to pay attention to that. It is really okay. There's, there's a, just because your daughter is worrying, just because she's stressed out does not mean she has an anxiety disorder does not mean that she has to start talking about herself and you have to start talking to her about how she has this thing called anxiety. A certain amount of anxiety and worry and stress is a normal part of life. If I were in front of all of you and I said, how many of you come from a family in which there is no anxiety, no depression and no substance abuse? None of you would be able to honestly raise your hands. I certainly would not be able to raise my hand, right? My family, all over the place, your family, probably all over the place too. It's part of being a human being. But what you wanna pay attention to is if you are seeing your child isolating, if they have a long history of this, that, that they avoid things, if you are working for the cult leader, it is time to start talking directly about this. Pull out that worry, give it a name, call it Sally, call it Joanne, call it Pete. Begin to notice and pay attention to what it says and what it does and how it shows up. If you are an anxious parent, pay attention to that catastrophic language. Pay attention to your own rigidity. Pay attention to, to how your anxiety and your worry is, is revealed and projected onto your kids. When I am in my office and I say to kids, which one of your parents is the worrier? And they do not, they, they, they don't go like, gosh, that's a tough question. Let me think about that. They do not do that. They're like, that one. Sometimes it's a double. They know they recognize it. Talk about it openly and work on changing these patterns. I want you to be more flexible rather than rigid. I want you to be able to break things down into parts when they're globally overwhelmed. I want you to think about the difference between being catastrophic, 
going to that worst case scenario and doing reasonable problem solving and a reasonable assessment of risk. I want you to talk and talk and talk about how malleable your teenager's brain is, that they, they have not figured out who they are in a lot of ways, that this is a time of trying things on and their brains are changing and growing. They do not have some permanent disease. That language is absolutely not helpful. And being able to really pay attention to how do you support positive external connection. We know that kids, teenagers, and adults that are involved in positive external connection have better mental health outcomes. We know it, it's not a mystery. So don't complicate this thing. Tolerating uncertainty, right? Rolling around in the mites and maybes of life. One of the homework assignments I give to families all the time is that at the dinner table, I want you to go around the dinner table and everybody talk about what unexpected thing happened to you today and how did you manage it? And you need to role model that too. Anxiety loves an emergency. That's what it does. It takes what's happening in our lives and it promotes it into an emergency. As I go through my life, I have the same stresses, same stuff you guys have. I say to myself on a regular basis, this is not an emergency. A lot of anxious people actually do really well in actual emergencies, right? It's all of the storytelling that we do that gets us wound up. This is not an emergency an important differentiation to make. All right, uh, I am happy to take questions. So Rachel, you got anything for me? I do, I have a whole bunch for you. All right. So we're All gonna right. try to get to them. Um, and I have been getting a lot of questions from folks about if you will get a recording, you absolutely will get this recording emailed to you. So, all right, first question, in an acute moment, of teens' intense emotions, irate, sad, um, frustrated, different things like that. Are there any tips on how we parents should be respond should be respond and what we should say in that acute moment to be helpful in the short term and to build the teen skills versus my manage our own anxiety? Okay, great question and a very a very common question that I get. So most people don't like the answer because here's, here's the answer. <laughs> in, the, in the acute moment, there's not much you can do. No learning is happening. So in the acute moment, what you want to do is you want to be loving and supportive. You want to be present. And here, this is my, this is my number one parenting rule, people. You ready? Talk 85% less. Shut <laughs> your mouth right? Yeah. When they're in that acute moment and you're trying to solve the problem and you're trying to talk, they're not listening to you anyway. So what you want to say, you want to say something like, it looks like you're really having a tough time right now. You want to listen. You want to empathize, right? Now, so that said, that's the acute moment. Here's the important thing. We do not teach kids how to swim when they jump in the water and go under the first time. You have to do the work ahead of time. So if you have a child who is prone to worry or anxiety or big reactions, you have to have these conversations ahead of time. I will tell you, the thing I do with everybody is we pull out the worry and we give it a name and we start listening. As soon as you create some distance, right? So here's your worry. And you start becoming an observer of it. It takes away its power. It's not hijacking you anymore. Now you are able to observe it. The thing about worry and anxiety and big emotions is they say the same thing over and over and over again. The content might be different, but what it's saying is some version of blah, 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 and you can't handle it. And then it's going to freak you out. So in the moment, Doing some breathing, great idea. Is that the only thing kids should learn? No, it's a really good reset. But I'll tell you, I meet kids, I'm like, you've been in therapy for four years. What have you learned? And they're like, breathing. I'm like, really? That's all you learned? So, but breathing is good because it's a physiological reset. 
remember too, when kids are sort of having this explosive moment, a lot, a lot of times we focus on calming down, calm, 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 calm. I don't use the word calm very often. I use the word reset or reboot. And, all, and remember that movement is really helpful for a lot of people. So when people are sort of freaking out, we're like, oh, calm down, relax. Blah, blah, blah. That's, not, that's not the answer for a lot of people. You might say, you know what, let's do 20 jumping jacks. Let's go outside and run around. Let's take the dog for a walk. Movement really helps, but no problem solving happens in the middle of the hurricane. So talk 85% less, shut up, but you got to do the work ahead of time. So you, and, and maybe afterwards you do a little post-game analysis and you say, you know what, you got really upset. Let's think about how we can manage this. The next time this shows up, what do we want the response to be? And in general, I want the response when worry shows up, I want the response to be some version of, oh yeah, it's you again. I, I know what you're up to, right? Is it unpleasant? Yes. Do you want it to show up? No. But being able to have that, that little bit of distance and to be able to say, oh, hello, you know, Sally, nice to see you. And you should pull out your worry too, parents, and give your teenage daughter permission to call you out on your worry. Right. So when Joanne is, you know, out, out there doing all the ca catastrophizing, I want your teenage daughter to be like, oh, mom, please tell Joanne to stuck a stuff a sock in it, for God's sakes. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, next question, Lynn, you are speaking my language. <laughs> I love it. Um, so since sleep is so crucial to mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and functioning. Are there any suggestions to get young tweens to bed when they fight it? Uh, yes. Don't let them have their phones. <laughs> there should not be screens in their bedrooms. And it is interesting. Um, so anyway, that's one thing. We know that screens keep people up. We know that screens keep uh, kids up. Um, the, the, the interesting thing about that is that for some reason, and I don't know what it is about smartphones, but all these parents that are really capable of getting so much done and parenting their children, when it comes to phones, they, they suddenly forget all of their skills, right? They're like, what should I do? She wants, a, she wants her phone and I don't know what to do. And I'm like, take it away. So getting the, getting the phone out of the bedroom. And then I think it really is about consistency. And I think it's giving kids information about how important sleep is. I don't make um, a huge big deal. I don't make a huge big deal about bedtime. You know, some, some families have like a two hour routine, um, but I think you need to be really clear and really direct that sleep is something that's important. Um, I want you and, and define what that looks like. I want you in your room. You can read for a little while. I want you, I want you rolling down the day, wrapping up the day. And the expectation is that you're going to be in bed sleeping. And, and just, you know, if, if you're listening to this and you have a 17 year old and they have their phone in the room, you know, that ship has sailed. But if you've got a 12 year old, A, they shouldn't have a smartphone, right? Delay, delay, delay. Same thing, smartphones and substances, delay, 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 delay. Don't tell me that your 11 year old needs a smartphone because they don't by the way. So delay, delay, delay. And then just be very clear about what the limits are about what is in their bedroom at night. Light in your eyeballs keeps you up. So be very clear about it. The other thing too, is that you don't have to negotiate this all the time. You can be a little bit flexible, but you can say, this is, this is what the expectations are and let them be mad at you. And, you know, if I'm not, I'm not huge on punishment, I'd rather do, I, you know, we know that behaviorally, uh, behavioral theory is that rewards work better than punishment. But if you've got a kid that's like, I'm not going to bed, you can say, well, I'll take your phone until we figure this out. Right. So just be very matter of fact about it. Just be very matter of fact about it. Parenting can be a tug of war, but here's the, here's the secret people. Don't pick up the rope. You don't pick up the rope. There's no game. There's no tug of war, but just very matter of fact about it for sure. Yeah. Um, how does a teenager with anxiety manage relationships with friends 
who have a hard time understanding when they need time alone or away when a, lar when a large group is overwhelming. How does a teenager manage that? Yeah, so how, does the, how do you help your teen with anxiety manage needing to take space when their friends don't understand? Well, I, I, I don't think the friends need to understand, right? I mean, I don't, that's not the criteria. So, so I, I would have two responses to that. One is that if you've got a teenager that is learning how to take good care of themselves, and sometimes they like to be with their friends and sometimes they don't, I wouldn't turn that into like, I have anxiety, I need to be away from my friends and I need, to under, I need them to understand that. Right. This is where we get into this whole thing of like, this is my identity and my teens need to my my friends need to understand it. Right. You can just say very matter of factly, there are times when I like being with you guys. And there are also times when I don't like being with you guys and to communicate that clearly and not make it a huge issue. Remember, anxiety likes to promote things to an emergency. And so it is really OK to say, you know what, I just really want some time by myself without making it into this, you know, I'm anxious, I need time alone, my friends need to understand. No, they don't, right? You can say, I need some time alone. We really have to just take it down a notch so that it isn't this thing like, I'm so anxious, I'm so anxious. And I would, the question I would ask if I was in front of this teenager, I would say, how do your friends not understand? What does that look like, right? Yeah. yeah. And maybe, maybe it's like, well, I don't know. How do they not understand? All of you who have friends, if you had a friend that said, gosh, you know what? I am just feeling a little overwhelmed right now. I'm just going to need some time to myself. You wouldn't be like, what? You'd say, oh, all right. Yeah. Yeah. This is not, again, anxiety loves an emergency. Anxiety loves an emergency. It's not an emergency. Yeah. Um, how do you convince or encourage a teen who is depressed um, to actually work with a therapist when they say mm. therapy doesn't work and they have failed attempts? Okay, so here's the question that I would ask. So for one, we did a podcast episode on that. What do you do when your teen is, is uh, denying that they have anxiety? So we talked about that. Um, if you've got, you know, the same goes with depression is that I would ask, tell me what you think happens in therapy. That's what I would ask. Tell me what you think happens in therapy. Um, Cause remember, Ar uh, you know, Arna said, I don't want to go to therapy. I don't just want to talk about my problems all the time. So you make them engaged in the process and you say, what, what do you, what, what do you think if you were going to go to somebody who is going to help you, what would you want that person to do? What do you think happens in therapy? Um, I will actually, Rachel, I will send you a link to a talk on depression that my mentor, Michael Yapko, did a few years ago. I think he was in Australia when he did it. But I think every teenager who's sort of thinking that maybe they're depressed and, or struggling with their mood should watch this. So you can include that in the resources that you send out. Um, it really is about information. There is a really great book, which I think now he just made it only um, available electronically, but it's still really worth checking out, called The Keys to Unlocking Depression, also by Michael Yapko, Y-A-P-K-O, The Keys to Unlocking Depression. It is an enormously informative and helpful book um, for teenagers on, I don't know where mine is, must be in my, yeah, but um, it's got, it's got on, on, each, it's a small book and on each page, I'm looking forward here in my, everything behind me looks really neat and tidy and everything out of the screen <laughs> that you can't see is a disaster. Um, but um, it's a book, you open it up and it'll have like a statement about depression. And then it'll have about a page and a half of really accurate information about it. So it's a wonderful resource. You can look at the book um, and, and open it to any page. And it really is very educational. So I'll send, I'll give, I'll give Rachel the link to that video so she can share that with all of you guys. But it really is about saying, what do you, what do you expect? There's a lot of misinformation out there. Teenagers are getting an enormous amount of crappy information about depression and anxiety. And so we just have to make sure we give them the accurate information. So have a conversation about it. Yeah. 
Lynn, do you have time just for one or two more sure. questions? I do. Oh, all right, great. So um, what are kind of the best strategies for helping a teen who is rather rigid or perfectionistic um, or wants to over-design the routines for uh, the family and herself? Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that rigidity in the home? Okay, so you talk about it very openly. And you say, you know what, you're pretty rigid. And maybe, you know, she'll say, well, you are too. So own it if you're rigid, right? Whoever else is rigid, own it. And then say, let's work on injecting some flexibility into this. If you have somebody who's perfectionistic, it doesn't mean that we're going to go all the way to the other side. And because if you say to a kid, particularly in high achieving uh, environments, it's fine for you to get C's. They're like, no, it's not because you adults created this system where C's aren't as good as A's. So I'm going to get A's. So you, you cannot say it's fine to be mediocre. They're not going to buy into it. But what you can start to do is say, where are the places in your life where you can be flexible? Where are the, because there are some places where we have to be rigid. Where are the places where you can be flexible? And are there some things that, some places where you can cut some corners, right? Where can you coast? Where can you cut some corners? Look for the places initially where they're overdoing things and start talking about cutting corners. Doesn't mean that you're gonna get an F in a class, but maybe you don't need to recopy your notes. The other thing to remember is that anxiety is, an, is a cult leader. And if you, in this, in this family culture, if the rigidity of this child has been dictating what the family does, you're gonna have to talk as a family about how you're not playing anymore. This is why pulling out the anxiety and talking about it in this way is so helpful because you're protecting your child's dignity and you're saying, I love you, but I do not like Sylvia. Sylvia is super bossy. So when Sylvia shows up and starts trying to boss us around, we're gonna work as a family to not let Sylvia dictate everything that goes on. Now, could your teenager say, oh my gosh, mom, that is so helpful. That is so, I love that, right? They could say that, but they're probably gonna say, no, I didn't <laughs> You're going to have to tolerate the fact that they're going to be pissed off, particularly if they've had years and years and years of believing they are in charge, right? So, and say that, and I even predict with families, I'll, I'll have a family in here and I'll say, look, so we're going to try this. And I'll say to the mom, she's going to think this is a great idea for about ah 72 hours. And then at some point you're going to say, oh, here comes Sylvia. And she's going to say, I hate this, blah, blah, blah. I say to parents, she's going to say, I hate that Lynn Lyons. And then that's exactly what happens. And the mom is like, oh, look, right? It's okay for you to piss your kid off. <laughs> Do not put the cult leader in charge because it just gets bigger and bigger and more powerful. So be very open about it. Acknowledge their distress. Don't, don't totally, you know, turn the whole thing upside down, but say, where can we cut corners? You are rigid about this. And I am not going to participate in Sylvia's rigidity. And then you've got to be consistent with it. It's going to be bumpy at first when you start changing it up, but it's going to be worth it. Yeah. And would you say those are the same strategies to use um, with a, a kiddo who's engaging in checking behavior, doubting themselves, things mm -hmm. like that? Or would yeah. you recommend um, something different so that they're not working towards the disorder? Yeah, so checking and doubting. So those are two things that, you know, those are kind of OCD-ish things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, OCD is, is, a, is a doubt factory. Anxiety is a doubt factory. So you just want to, you know, again, see the content doesn't matter. So if somebody is checking or somebody needs reassurance, they're asking questions over and over again, I do not care what they're asking about, right? That's not the issue for me. I'm going to call out the pattern. So I'm going to say, I can see now that you're caught up in this checking behavior. I'm not going to participate. The goal in treatment, of course, is to start to interrupt the compulsions, interrupt the checking, interrupt the seeking reassurance, interrupting the confessing. The content doesn't matter. The content doesn't matter. The content doesn't matter. Yeah. You got to ask yourself, you think, if, 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 if I were to turn to the anxiety and say, what do you think of this strategy? If the anxiety is like, you guys are awesome. 
then you got to shift gears. If the anxiety says like, what are you doing? You're not, you're not working for me anymore. Then you're on the right track. Yeah. But talk about it openly. Humor is great. We want to be loving and supporting and empathic, but we don't want to do the things that the anxiety is demanding of us. Thank you. And we had one last question. Sure. Um, why do some children uh, with a catastrophic parent take on the, that perspective as an adult and other children in the same household do not? So that is the, that is the, the question of all time. We know <laughs> that different kids have different temperaments. It is a combination of nature and nurture. So some kids have a different temperament, you know, Many of you have several kids and you'll think, God, he's so laid back and she is just so uptight. So temperament has um, it to do with, it has something to do with it. We don't parent all kids alike as much as we think we do. We don't parent them the same based on birth order and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it really is just this combination of nature and nurture and how it sort of mixes up and what's going on in a family's life. And, you know, I have one family where the, the first three are really anxious and the fourth Right. And the parent, the mom's like, we just didn't have any energy to teach him how to be anxious. We were like, yeah, go do what you want. And he's not <laughs> anxious. Right. So so there's just a lot of a of, of lot of this mixing. It is sort of interesting. I have had in my practice, I was just thinking about this the other day. I have had five sets of identical twins over the years. Okay. I have had I have identical twins where one kid was on the spectrum and one kid wasn't. I've had identical twins. It's very interesting. So they you know, they were one egg, man, and they became two eggs. So there's so many different factors that go into it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lynn. You're um, so I can't, welcome. I can't tell you how much we appreciate um, you being here with us today and sharing your, your wisdom. Um, I have placed a survey link in uh, the chat for everybody to fill out. I would ask that you please uh, provide us with, with your feedback. And I just want to add my thanks, Lynn and Arna, and thank you again to our sponsors who helped us be able to bring Lynn here. I hope everyone enjoyed uh, the uh, webinar and uh, fill out the survey and you will get the recording and the resources within the next few days. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, everybody. And thanks for spending time with me. Thanks for putting this all together, guys. It was a thank pleasure you for being, being here. here. Yeah. All right. Good night, everybody. I'll send that stuff to you, Rachel. Great. Thank you so much.